Hey, this is Brian Yellow, and on episode number 56 of Origin Stories on Creativity, I spoke with A.F.E. Smith. She's an editor of academic text by day and a fantasy author by night. Her first novel, Dark Haven, which was published in 2015, was selected by for publication out of 5,000 submissions to Harper Voyager's 2012 call for new writers. I, I can't even imagine the excitement of having that notification. Getting the knock on the door, getting the phone call, getting that email, you know, opening up your inbox and seeing you know, the email, clicking on it and seeing those words spreading out in front of your eyes. You won. You are selected. You are one of the the best writers that we took a look at and we want to publish a book she was a wonderful person to talk to she had quite a few great things to say about writing about living about working about being a mother about being an artist and i'm going to include notes where to find her how to contact her where to find her her books. Uh, she's working on a new series right now. I believe she said it's a series, if not a standalone. Um, she's got three novels standing right now in her series, the Dark Haven series, that you can find on Amazon. Highly recommend checking those out. Highly recommend checking her out. And with no further ado, here is Anna Smith. What is your name? <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> How come I don't have your name in my calendar? I need to know what your name is. How come I don't know what it is? And I'm looking through your frequently asked questions and I'm like, what? And then there's a little asterisk down on the bottom, frequently asked questions and unless you know my name. And I guess nobody knows your name unless you're family, huh? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's kind of a a badly kept secret these days at least my first name I, I mean I can give you that I, it's Anna that's that's not a secret anymore um but the rest of it is kind of still my secret identity so <laughs> lots of initials it is yes I, I that's kind of like a European thing huh <laughs> is, is it kind of family and and the length of it is it two names or just the it's, Anna that's a nice it's a name. family thing yeah so family thing. I, yeah I guess they They've accumulated over time, but um, yeah, so there you go. You get half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not even, like a quarter of it. Well, I guess I get the last name too, got, so that is yeah, half, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> um, Anna, that's that's very nice. I like that name a lot. Um, oh, thank you. So you are an editor by trade. I am, yes. And you yes. are a fantasy fiction writer by night. It kind of sounds like a superhero. <laughs> A really, really tired superhero, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> How much do you write at night when you get home? My goodness, all the words that must flow through your mind, your eyes. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of, I do my job, then I get home and I, I spend a few hours with my kids and get them to bed. And so then it's kind of trying to switch on the writing brain at, you know, eight o'clock at night and get a few hours in before I go to sleep. So it's pretty busy, but. My Good, gosh. I guess. How old are your kids? <laughs> they are three and five, so still pretty young. Um, quite a handful at times. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. My kids are two and a half, and it's tough. I wake up at two o'clock in the morning just so I can do writing. They, When they yeah. enter my head, it's like the echo of children. Basically, it just takes it out of me. Yeah, do they come in in the middle of the night and wake you up? Because we're getting that a lot at the moment. So really, then my <laughs> son. Yeah. My son <laughs> has been doing this thing lately where he wakes up screaming in the middle of the night a couple of times for my wife, mm -hmm. and she's really good. Do you think it's nightmares or? Hello. Oh, can you not hear me? Uh, ah, I think you may have just vanished there for a minute. Like, okay. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I was talking. I was talking about my son. How he wakes up in the middle of the night and and kind of screams, and my wife goes in there and wakes him up. 
that wakes him up, but sleeps with him for a little while. And you know, she's very, very good at that. My daughter will sleep. She just sleeps. She loves to sleep. She does not want to wake uh, up for anybody. Perfect kind of child. <laughs> yeah, she's always been kind of really good like that. Yeah, it makes things a bit easier. <laughs> what kind of work? What do you edit during the day? I I work for um, a university, a distance learning university, and so I edit the stuff that we that we send to students. So all of the course materials, that kind of thing. So it's all kind of academic texts, that that sort of thing. Um, so quite different from what I write at night. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you, you blacked out on I me. Mean, I think the internet's haunting us right now. Oh, no. Um, yeah, so I, um, I work for a distance learning university. Um, so we have a lot of kind of remote students from uh, all over the world, really. And so I edit the, the text that the students learn from. Um, so printed materials online, all sorts of stuff. I mean, how do you go from that, which is kind of dry to writing about, you know, the fantasy elements of kind of doing and daring and, you know, adventure of fantasy? Do you find yourself wanting to just drop the, the academic? I think it long? actually works quite well because I think if I, I mean, I, I love to work with words in general, but I think if I was editing anything that was too close to what I write, then I wouldn't be able to write the same kind of stuff because it would just be too much. But because it's really, really different, it means that each thing is a break from the other thing. And so it, they kind of complement each other that way. That's interesting. So would you ever consider quitting the day job and maybe working with other writers? Um, I guess I might consider it. I mean, as long as I was doing something kind of vaguely words related then i think i would would be happy um would that impact your fiction though well that's that's the thing i mean i i think for a while even after i started editing the kind of subjects that i do i found it really hard to read and write creatively because i was i was always very analytical about it because I, I had just got my brain into that kind of mindset and it's taken me a while to be able to separate those two things back out and read for pleasure and write without thinking too much about the editing side of things and so oh, that is, a... for is reading for pleasure now is taking a back seat i really have not been able to pick that back up again um since my kids were born and writing and doing the podcast and all that stuff i have not been able to actually like sit back and enjoy a book in the longest time but you do you commute to work uh, I I don't commute to work because um, I'm lucky enough to live very close to work so I can I'm just uh, 10 minutes away but I I think actually when my children were born that actually gave me a little bit more time in a way to read which sounds stupid but it's because because I was feeding them quite a lot and I could read on my phone and so it was that kind of opportunity where you're sitting down with a baby or whatever and so actually it worked quite well for me as a, a way to have some time for reading. And so I've been able to maintain that to a certain extent. Obviously, it's always hard to fit everything in. Yeah. What do you like to read now? Still fantasy? Yeah, I'll read anything, really. I mean, yeah, obviously, I love to read fantasy. I read quite a lot of kind of thrillers and crime type books as well. Um, but um, young adult stuff, children's even, I mean, just anything that I can get my hands on. Well, your novels have an element of romance to them, don't they? They do, yes. Yeah. Do you like romance in your reading? I do. I, I don't tend to read kind of that much from the actual romance genre, I guess, but I do like to have an aspect of romance in what I read because I think it's such a big part of kind of human life in general that... Mm -hmm. Often, if I if I read a book and there's there's not even any kind of uh, romantic relationship, even kind of a hint of it, it, I tend to think there's a little bit of humanity missing almost from that. If that makes sense, so. well, it does make sense. And well, in terms of who you are as an author, because what I was reading about you is that you're kind of celebrated for your your romantic plot threads. Would that be fair to say? Uh, I. 
I'm not sure if celebrated is the right word, but I'm happy to take it, you know. Well, you're English, so any kind of complimentary things I offer you, you're automatically going to shoot down. Is that? Oh, obviously, yeah. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> I like that, though, in terms of being human, you have to have that kind of romantic flair to it. And, and um, where, do, where uh, is it just in terms of procreation, or where do you think the romance comes from? Oh, I mean... I think maybe it's and as a mother, than obviously. Just, yeah, it's broader than just romance. I think it's it's maybe love in all its different forms. And so, I mean, so in my most recent book, for instance, the parent-child relationship is quite a big part of that. And so, it, that's another aspect that I think is is really important. And it's just kind of all the different ways that humans love each other is kind of that is a a big part of what it is to be human and so that seems like a, a good thing to write about so where does the challenge come in your novel is it against the love does it try to tear the love apart it i yeah to a certain extent i suppose that's it's probably true of, of quite a lot of books i guess that the the things that happen and the challenges are the things that turn people against each other stop them seeing the good in each other maybe and so that's kind of the opposite of and and usually i would say in the stuff that i write it would be the love that people feel for each other in the various different forms you know it could just be friendship or or family or whatever that is that's what wins them through in the end i think what finding that again once it's lost um more maybe that that's what gives them the strength to overcome the obstacles that they face. Um, Cause I'd say that's, that's probably true. Well, I can only speak for myself, but kind of for myself, I would say that that's what gives me strength is the, the relationships that I have with people and, and caring about people. Um, so that's what I would put into my fiction. And you're writing more in a, uh, a, a steampunk environment as well, correct? It steampunk, is yeah. Steampunkish, yeah. Steampunkish. <laughs> can you can you speak of that? Uh, speak to that? I mean, in terms of what do you mean, ish? Magic, it's, well, technology, it's the merging of. It's steampunk light, I'd say, because <laughs> it's kind of yeah. I mean, we have there's a very limited amount of magic in that we have some people who can turn into fearsome creatures. Um, oh, that's so right. That you do have that shape-shifting kind of element. Shape yeah. element, don't you? But that's literally the only magical thing that there is in that world. So that's it's only shape-shifting. Yeah. And it, it's kind of presented almost like, cause it's all to do with alchemy. And so it's, it's kind of on the borderline between science and magic, I guess, um, in the, the suggestion being that if you could understand it well enough, it wouldn't be magic. It, it's just... It would just be purely scientific. Yeah. Um, so so steampunk in the, in the sense that the world that, that I'm writing in is in the kind of... It's going through an industrial revolution, so it's that kind of time. It's it's not sort of medieval type fantasy. It's that a little bit more advanced. Um, so you, you know you've got your kind of your coal and your factories, and and they've got the airships and things. And so it's it's that kind of, I guess that's what makes it have a steampunk flavour. But I wouldn't say it's strictly steampunk in that um, it doesn't fully go down that kind of road. I guess. No, I saw that you're you're a big history fan right or no did i see that where did i read that you were or did I, I make that up you could have made it up i'm not sure if it's written anywhere but i i wouldn't say it's a, a lie i think i'm interested in history and and um yeah i think that's fair to say where in history do you find yourself most drawn is it that industrial area of of England where people are dying of that mysterious fog that rolled over London or, <laughs> or God, man, I, that, that story itself is just so scary. You know, I mean, you're walking down the streets of London, all of a sudden this poisonous fog just rolls over everybody. Yeah. And 
start keeling over, right? I mean, how scary is that? Or are you more keen to another era of of history? I mean, where do you find yourself drawn to in terms of history? Um, I would say, well, when when I was a teenager growing up, it was it was always kind of Regency and kind of you know the sort of Regency romance type of thing but i think maybe now jane Eyre is like the first book and that is a wonderful thing by the way i didn't like pour over your your website because i only got it this morning right but i did get an opportunity yeah. <laughs> i mean I, I wake up at two o'clock in the morning to write because my kids like i said i'm one of those writers i cannot talk to anybody before i do any writing if i do it just disturbs the flow of creativity i'm one of those jerks Anyway, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I sit in front of my keyboard and I do my little artist thing, pounding on the keyboard. And then I, I work out and I come home and take a nap. And then I looked at your, your materials. I'm like, oh, okay, I like this stuff. So everything that I was reading. And then, of course, I schedule all my interviews for 1 o'clock. So I'm sitting here at like 1 o'clock going, where is she? Where is my interview? <laughs> <laughs> and I look at my, my calendar like, oh, it's at 2 o'clock. <laughs> So from one o'clock to two o'clock, instead of looking at your website, I'm twittering and looking at other stuff instead of doing research. So that's just how prepared I am. Anyway, <laughs> Jane Eyre, you like that romantic period of what the 18th century, kind of Queen Victoria? Yeah, I mean yeah. that's that's what that's what I. Yeah, that's really a big part of what I grew up reading. I think is that kind of, and maybe that's where the sort of the romance aspect my writing has even come from I don't know but yeah I certainly always liked that kind of time period um but I think yeah and now I think in my writing it would probably be more just any period of history where there's been quite a fundamental change in the way that that impacts people and kind of how they deal with that I think that's always an interesting thing to look at so obviously the industrial revolution is one really major time in history where there was a lot of upheaval and a lot of change and then I guess you could look again at recent history and the internet and all that kind of thing all of that's really fascinating to me so you've written three books in this world and the fourth one is on its way published or being written the fourth one is being written um, and I'm not entirely sure what will happen to it Oh. Because I, at the moment, I've been working on a different series. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> That's good, though. I mean, you're stretching yeah. as a writer. Honestly, my opinion is that you need to get out and do other stuff. I mean, if you get stuck in one thing as an artist, I mean, what are you exactly? I see tons of authors do that. Their entire career is like one thing. It's like, aren't you interested in exploring other stuff? So, I mean, it makes me happy that you're you're out doing other things and exploring your your um you know, your, your creativity. What's the other series called or what's the other series about? Or do you want to talk about it at all? It's, I, I, <laughs> I could talk about it. It's, it's, um, but not a huge amount probably because <laughs> it's still kind of, I, I, so I've written the first book in this series. It's, it's much more, it's very firmly young adult, this series, as opposed to kind of the dark Haven books are sort of, you know adult but young adult as well so that they're perhaps a more sort of a broader um appeal but this is this is very much a young adult series um mm -hmm. and it's more of a it's kind of an epic fantasy i suppose um in term, and like uh it's... could you suggest who would be like uh mm, i don't know who would you owe some kind of I don't know, who would you owe a, what word am I looking for here? <laughs> who would be a close kin <laughs> to your novel? To the series. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know what I'm asking, hmm. it's just not coming out yeah. directly. <laughs> I'm just trying to think about that. I mean, it's, this, this is a series that I've actually had kind of, it's been around for a while while I've been working on other things, it's kind of been there in the background, kind of bubbling away, you know. Um, it's it's very complicated, which is why I, I kind of put it aside and, and decided to write something a bit more straightforward in terms of, you know, plot and everything. This is, this, it's a very complicated plot, this one. 
so I don't know if anything will come of it, but it's interesting to try new things. So yeah, that's interesting. Do you write any short fiction also, or do you only kind of stick to the longer form? I have written short fiction before. I've done short stories. I've done flash fiction even, but recently not so much. I don't know why that kind of. I don't seem to have the ideas for that. It's. I mean, I feel like short fiction is much more. You've got to have a good concept there to to write anything at all. You can't just start writing and see where it takes you because it's it's going to be the plot that kind of makes it succeed or fail. And so, for whatever reason, I don't seem to have very many short fiction ideas floating around at the moment. But I hopefully, love short I'll get back to that sometime. <laughs> I love yes, short fiction. I mean it's a great form. Yeah. And then I, I totally understand what you mean about having that thing in the back of your head. And I've got so many of the novels that I want to be working on. And the one that I'm currently working on just constantly feels like it's in the way of me working on something else. And I cannot wait to finish it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why are you still here? Why are you still in my way? I want to work on something else. Like my first one, I still feel like I have work to do on it, you know? So I went ahead and published it on Amazon just so I can get it out of my way. Yeah. Well, I, I think there comes a point where you just have to say no more tinkering, don't you? And just let it go out there. Yeah. Mm. So you did that. And then you, um, you did that with your first novel. Let me pull up your works again. What was it called? So where are you? When... Dark Haven. Dark Haven. Yeah. You won a contest with that out of 5,000 contestants. Uh, yeah, so this was... Oh my God, how um, did that feel? <laughs> how was, did you get the notice good. for that? I mean, did you get it a notice good. out in the mail, or did you get a notice in the email? I mean, how did they let you know, hey, so, AFE Smith, you won. 5,000 people, 4,999 <laughs> people have just been notified they're losers, and you are the winner, and we're going to publish you. And not, I mean, you got published big, too. Harper Voyager, which is a gigantic publishing house, right? It is. Like, it is a big oh one. Yeah. God, I can't even imagine the feeling that would have. How are you alive right now? I mean, did your heart <laughs> just stop in your chest and they had to resurrect you? Are you even like a living thing? Or are you like a zombie <laughs> of the person that existed prior to them telling you that you're you won this contest? That would explain quite a lot. Actually, if I am a zombie. <laughs> no, um, yeah, the the uh, the good thing about that that email actually they they sent it as an email and. It arrived the day before my birthday. Wow. And so it said, oh, can, can we speak on the phone? And so so I ended up getting that call on my birthday, which it seems like. And there was a knock on the door. The there were a couple can... <laughs> ambulance workers just waiting there. And you're like, can I help you? No, we're, gonna be, we're here to help you answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. yeah, but um, to be fair. It wasn't just me that there was there were a whole group of writers okay. actually that they picked up from that. How many were there? So I don't want to make out like I'm the only one. Um, so I think about fifteen. I think there were in the UK. So or picked up by Voyager UK. So yeah, we so made it a little so community cool. there for a while. Was, yeah. And what did what did that entail in terms of winning? So it was, I mean, because the, the, the contest, it was, it was more of kind of, it was basically an open door submission. So um, they were looking for new authors to publish. And so all of the, the people that they picked out, they went ahead and, and published them. And the, we, we've done through a digital first program. So it comes out as an ebook and then it comes out as a paperback later on. Um, and so, yeah, it, just went through the whole standard publishing process which was quite interesting to see from the other side having been an editor and then you know uh, having my stuff edited so that was interesting and good um so you had a professional editor working with you yes how did that yeah. feel as an editor being edited because i mean i understand you probably have grammar and and wordsmithing down pat right and somebody's telling you we need to work this sentence and we need to do this and you probably should shift this paragraph and well it's interesting i mean i i guess 
that kind of that side of things the the sort of the details and the grammar and everything it got copy edited and proofread and everything but they didn't really find a great deal because I'm an editor and so obviously I I think what I write is fairly polished in that respect where a lot of their work came in it was was with structural editing because no matter how good an editor you are I think editing your own work it's always difficult and someone else coming in and saying well actually you could strengthen it by doing these things and maybe putting a new scene in here or that kind of thing that's uh -huh. where it's so valuable to have someone else's um expert yeah, opinion yeah. I guess so mm. that was really really good and I enjoyed that a lot are you still in touch with the original editor or have you moved on with every subsequent book was that a relationship had... that continued is what I meant yeah, I had I had the same editor for two books, um, but then she got a job at a different publishing house, and so um, I didn't get to work with her for the third, which is a shame because it's when, once you've built up a, a, a kind of a good relationship with your editor, then you you kind of want to keep them, but mm -hmm. that's just the way it works. So, are you are you happy that you went with with Harper Collin or Harper Voyager? Do you wish you had gone independent at all? Or do you think that you your career is progressing the way that you wanted it to? Do you think that you're as powerful as an author as, as you could be with a I don't know. traditional? <laughs> I, it's, it's a I don't even think I'm asking the right question. interesting question. You think it is? You understand what no, I'm trying to ask? Yeah, I, I, mean, I do. Because there are I a do, lot of people out there that are trying to do this independently without the powerhouse of a publishing firm behind them and they're floundering right i mean they're good authors and you're obviously got a lot of uh skills because you stood out among five thousand people whether you, you know you were in a group of 20 people or not you stood out and maybe you would stand out on your own you know what i mean maybe you would have a host of five thousand people behind you or millions of people behind you maybe making a considerable sum of money or whatever do you think that you would be able to do this on your own or do you think that you would be able to uh, you think you would need harper voyage do you think they're supporting you the way that you need to be supported is what i'm asking or can you even speak on that <laughs> you think you tell me to shut up and let you answer the question because obviously <laughs> No, that's fine. I'm just I'm putting all my thoughts together on this because I mean it's it's a complicated question I think and what I've I've wanted to be a writer since I was a little girl and I always imagined that it would be traditional publishing because back then that's the only thing there was right. you know and this is the whole indie scene is so new still. Um, and it's so, besmirched, right? I mean, it's not a it's not a glorious scene either. It's like kind of got the slush pile everybody's out there doing it and it's dirty and kind of muddy it's, and yeah i mean it's it's kind of i think it's good and bad i mean i i can see the the appeal of of doing it yourself and kind of having ultimate control over everything um not giving up a large portion of the royalties you know and but at the same time i mean for me i i'm always full of self-doubt i mean that's just my thing and so having someone else who's you know a major publishing company come and say your work is worth something it's valuable we yeah. want to have it that's like such a I don't think I would have ever found the courage to necessarily do it myself without that happening and so maybe yeah, in the future I amazing. could now because Mate, now did, that I've been that validation too, right I mean this is they did yes, cover it it's beautiful work it's gorgeous. It's yeah, the covers are absolutely amazing. So uh, that's it's all been yeah, it's been really really good, and I wouldn't change it definitely. I mean, I'm really glad that it's happened the way it did. Um, you know, could I could I be more successful? Yes, of course. But you know, I think it's been a really good starting point for me, and I hope that it's something that I can build on and. And keep going forward with really how do you think you could build on it they don't well, they don't hold your hand right they're not babysitting you they're not saying you know no. anna you need to do blah 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 they're saying okay we've done this for you now it's your turn to do whatever right yeah 
yeah so i mean what i would hope i, I think that's partly also why i've i've gone ahead and kind of written a different series and a new series and you know maybe widening out my audience and when I approach people because I mean at the moment I'm still kind of pursuing the the traditional publishing path and so I hope that being able to say I've already had these three books published by a, a major publisher you know that that will help me sell the next thing you know and and go on from there so fingers crossed <laughs> yeah that's very interesting so what about um my my thing the thing that i've been thinking a lot about is audience development and that's one of the issues that i think you know do you have an agent i don't have an agent because of the way it happened for me with with this open door and and people submitting directly and so at the time when when they offered me the deal that would have been the perfect time for me to go to an agent and say hey i've got this deal would you like to take me on but i was so kind of overwhelmed and excited that i just signed up you know signed on the dotted line for the contract and since then i felt like actually it would have been really nice to have an agent and you know somebody who could be in my corner and help me kind of figure out different things and so that's what i'm hoping for this time around with the new series um but of course that's a whole extra layer of sort of things to get through before you can actually get your book out there because it's agent and then the publisher so yeah what about the other authors that you were in the contest with have you been keeping an eye on their careers yeah i mean when we all first were approached, um, we formed a little group online just so we could kind of support each other and keep each other informed what was going on and everything because it was new to all of us really. So it's it's always really good to find other authors who are in a similar position that you, totally. can, you can help support each other. So yeah, we most of us I think were in that group, maybe all, and, and we, we've stayed in touch since i would say and we, we're still kind of there on twitter and facebook etc and um so yeah we i think we certainly keep in touch and help each other out where we can it's very interesting so in terms of your future what would be your your biggest plan i mean obviously you're writing you're you're done with the trilogy dark haven Golden Fire and Windslinger. No, well, let me back up. Windslinger does it end on a natural kind of conclusion to the series, or do you think that it deserves a fourth book? Well, originally I was planning that series to have seven because mm. <laughs> there's nothing like being ambitious. You know? <laughs> so it was going to be a seven book series, but each of the books has its own standalone story, and so. Mm you can stop at any point really so yeah, i was reading that you could pick although, up golden fire and read it on its own yeah i would i would say that's true for each of the books i mean obviously there's a certain amount of character development that happens across the series but you can read each of the books by themselves and so i have a vision for what the other four books in the seven book series would be um to exist and it wouldn't be that I've left readers hanging at the end of Winsinger and they never get to find out what happens because it has got its own conclusion and so I hope to write them but if I don't hopefully it won't annoy too many people <laughs> and the the new series that you're writing has nothing to do with this this world at all but it does involve a fantasy type of uh, element or are you getting out of that genre entirely no, it is fantasy, but it's completely separate fantasy. Yeah, so um, are you getting to into do with the other books? Um, do you like fantasy and sci-fi? Do you consider yourself a spec author? Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Have you ever considered writing science fiction or anything like that? Uh, not really. No. Um, I, I've always been a fantasy reader rather than a sci-fi reader. Um, I kind of dabble maybe in soft sci-fi but I, 
hard sci-fi is not really my thing so I tend much more towards the fantasy side of of the spectrum there I'd say so um, I just don't feel like I would have enough knowledge to write sci-fi I feel like that's actually quite a technical genre in some ways and you probably need to understand a bit about kind of the, the underlying science of what you're writing about which uh, Ooh, somebody should go back in so. time and uh <laughs> somebody should go back in time and tell george lucas that because that dude doesn't know nothing about science at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but, but he, he star wars isn't sci-fi though is it no really? no no it's, it's sword and uh, what is it so. called <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like sword in space, isn't it? Or sword in something. Or fantasy, uh, what do they call it? It's fantasy, no, I don't know what it's called. Who is Paul Powell? Oh, Paul Powell. <laughs> so um, when we had the, the um, you know, there was a, a tower fire in London, the Grenfell Tower fire, oh. um, which is quite a, a major thing that happened. And um, a whole group of authors got together to raise money to help the people who are affected by that and so i donated some books and along with the books came the promise that whoever won my auction would become my official antagonist and so paul powell is the winner of the auction so he is now my official antagonist <laughs> so he is now your bad guy he is yeah so <laughs> he's a very gonna... lovely bad guy though so. is he <laughs> yeah. what are you gonna do with him or what is he going to do to earn this official antagonist? <laughs> God, no, you don't want to be my official antagonist. They're really horrible people in all of my stories. It's it's not good. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we have probably the least problematic protagonist antagonist relationship ever because we just very nice to each other by email. So <laughs> there you go. Oh man, that that tower fire that was horrible. I can't imagine that. Yeah. I moved to New York. It was, um, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please tell me. I I'm really interested. I, that tower fire was just horrendous. I can't even imagine living in that building. And there are other ones like that too, all across the city of London, all across the city of New York too. There are places in this city that they're like. They're like 50 stories of just horribleness. I can't even imagine living in them. They're, they're just, they're projects that just go up forever. I have story ideas that I want to write about them. And them catching fire. It was, just, yeah. Like a nightmare. I know. It was, it was a terrible thing to have happened. Um, but it, it seemed it kind of pulled people together as well in a way. And I'm, I'm really glad that the author community as a group of people were able to, to come together and do something positive to, to help with that. Cause in I moments, feel like you know what it, it, it makes me upset. It's like in moments the the thing happens, people go, Oh, that's so sad. And then for like a week or two or a month, people go, all right, we're going to do something. And then the month is over with and they forget about it. But, there are 60 or 70 other buildings exactly like that, that those people had something to do with that are still without fire alarms or whatever, painted with yeah. the same materials, that one fire and how many people died? And it wasn't three figures. It was still like 50 or 60 or what? some horrible number still. And people could still just uh, badly die. I yeah, mean, this, they could. yeah, there, there are buildings in the city that explode all the time all the time in New York City. There are places that just explode for no reason. One minute they're standing, people live in them, and the next minute they're rubble on the ground. Why? Because there was a gas leak or some horrible, stupid thing that shouldn't have happened. It happened all the time. I mean, it's just, why? Because landlords don't do the proper maintenance or something. I don't know. Yeah. And then we care for like a day, and then we forget about it. Unless there's a famous person that dies. Then we care about it for maybe two days. But nobody cares about the poor people. <laughs> I laugh, but I'm really, I don't think it's funny. I think it's kind of sad. Not, it's not funny at all, but it's, I suppose that kind of transitory engagement with tragedy is just kind of what you get from social media in general, isn't it? It's kind of a passing thing where everybody is sad and then the next thing comes along tomorrow. But I hope that 
at least it can bring people together and, and hopefully do something more long lasting about these things. Yeah, we only care, honestly, the more we care is if there's a pretty face you could slap on the event too. The prettier the face, the longer we'll care. If there's no pretty face, then we won't care at all. We won't even pay any attention to it. If there's a bombing in Africa or something along those lines, we won't even pay attention at all. The, the, the event will just go away. It won't even make the evening news for more than like a 30 second spot. That's how long we'll care. And I think that's the saddest thing at all from the entire, <laughs> I think that's the saddest thing of all when we just don't even care enough to even pay attention for longer than 30 seconds. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do, I do. Um, but that's, I think it's partly a consequence of the, the kind of world we live in now where we're so bombarded with a lot of different information and just different, you know, there's, there's kind of hundreds of news stories coming at us and people's attention spans short and they kind of flip from thing to thing but then I think we still have to look at the positive side and say well at least we now have the ability to find out about things that before we would never have known and so there's got to be a, a good side to it as well I think and that's very I true we do look on the positive side <laughs> we do live on a planet with seven billion people and we do live in one of the safest times in American history uh, in American history we do live <laughs> we do live in one of the safest <laughs> times in human history and you know you're alive now you probably have clean water you probably have a lot abundance of food you probably live in a very warm and comfortable environment it's a great time to be a human so yeah um on the whole and i think hopefully we're moving gradually in the direction of becoming more thinking more globally about humanity and kind of not just in our own backyard so that's got to be maybe a positive of the internet and kind of the way we can actually connect with people from across the world you know so hopefully we'll start seeing ourselves as a a global species and not just these kind of little pockets of different people. And I guess that's what upsets me the most is when something horrible happens in Nigeria and I've got to dig to find out how many casualties are involved or why exactly or what group did it or this, that and the other thing or why the, the, the president's wife of whatever country got arrested for this, this crime or the other. It's like I want to know a little bit more what is actually happening there? Why is this president 90 something years old and still a president? I do want to be more of, <laughs> I do want to be a global, global person or global yeah, species. Definitely. And we have more ability to do that than we've ever had. And I assume that it will only become more so in the future, or at least I hope so. I think that's kind of the way we have to go if we want to, survive as a species is to to see ourselves as a collective um so i think we're probably going in the right direction but sometimes it feels very slow yeah we started this conversation talking about the incident this morning in london on the the, the, the what's it called the underground and yeah. that person probably is not going to be available to have be on my podcast or a person like that that's not going to be available to the LA podcast to talk about his feelings or his novel or whatever. I, I wonder what the intention there is. You know what I mean? What would cause a person like that to stop hating so much to want to cause death and destruction? It's religious based, obviously. Yeah. I, I don't know. know. I mean, I, I mean, think... we're writers. What do we want at the end of the day? We want to understand what humanity is, right? I mean, we both write yeah. fantasy and science fiction, and we have to write the human element to it. We can't forget about that. You want to write about romance, and what destroys romance is the antagonist in your story. And to destroy the antagonist, you kind of rekindle the romance, and you have to understand, basically, I mean, would you agree that what the antagonist is hate? right yeah i would say so um and pe people aren't born hating 
So something causes that, right? Something causes it. Yeah. How do you get rid of the antagonist? You fill that void, you destroy the antagonist, you kill the antagonist. I mean, what do you do with the antagonist? How do you get rid of the antagonist? I mean, I look at my the novel that I'm writing right now. I have an antagonist, obviously. I have many. You know, I have humans. I have this AI thing, and I'm thinking about what do I do at the end of my novel? How do I get rid of this antagonist? This this huge monstrosity. How do I get rid of this? You can't beat it. It's a planet-sized thing. So what do I do? You know what I mean? You just can't just blow yeah. it up. I mean, it's the size of an Earth or the size of a sun or whatever, how big it's going to be at the end of the day. What do I do? How do I solve the problem of my antagonist, this unbeatable thing? What do I give it to make it happy, make it go away? I mean, how do you fight your antagonists? I mean, when you write a story, how do you, how do you look at it? How do you fight Paul Powell, the nice guy? <laughs> <laughs> How do you fight Paul Powell? He's a nice guy, right? And you want to make him happy. And that's the worst kind, isn't it? You want to make him happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, this is, it's kind of a huge question, I guess. Um, if you're it's the ultimate about question. It. Yeah, and then the antagonist as this kind of global problem. Um, I, At the end I of the day, if you know. knew that guy was going to walk on the subway this morning and try to kill people, I mean, last week, you have the ability to stop him from doing that. Would you kill him first? You know, Anna, Anna Smith? Or what would you do? Would you try to talk him out of it? <laughs> You know, Paul Powell, he's the guy. What are you going to do? I don't, it's a dumb example. I don't even know. But I, I don't understand God. what I'm asking. I, I just imagine I you over there being, you know, polite English lady saying, oh, this guy, he's so crazy. How do I get off this podcast? <laughs> no, I, I think, okay, so if I know that, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure you can kill them. I'm not sure you can kill Never. someone in advance even if you know they're going to do something terrible because you might be wrong about that. Right. I mean, if you don't, you nobody is omniscient. So if you, you can't know that anyone's going to do something terrible, but you can try and contain them, I suppose. I, don't know. I think, I think it's, it's probably a more, it's probably a more fundamental question than it's possible to solve because you've got to go back right back to their whole kind of upbringing and the influences that they come into contact with um it's not a sort of it's not a simple problem is it it's not i would have solved it by now if it was if it was a simple problem that had a simple answer no because the problem with paul powell is that he's comfortable you know he gets to go home and on Sunday, he probably calls his mom. And on Tuesday, if he's divorced, he gets to go hang out with his kids. Or, you know, he gets to crawl into bed with his wife every night. Or, you know, wake up to cuddle his, his child if it starts crying. But the guy on the subway, he's alone, right? He lit a bomb because he doesn't care. His, his dad died in a horrible drone attack in Afghanistan in 2011. You know, his mom mm -hmm. died of dysentery in 2001 or something horrible, some, you know, man-made this, that, and the other thing. He was never get, able to get married because he didn't have any property. He doesn't have any money. He's considered, you know, dirty or whatever the hell religious nastiness shrouded him with some kind of horrible reputation. So he has nothing. He's just an outcast. He's a refugee. He's never going to have any property. He's got nothing to look forward to in his life. So, hey, I might as well walk into a subway and do something horrible to a whole bunch of people that think I'm disgusting anyway. So, I mean, where's this future? Where's this past? He has no past and he has no future. So he might as well just destroy a whole bunch of people's hopes and dreams, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so we did this to him and he's going to do something to us back. So how do you take all yeah. that back? I mean, that's so, what I look at when I see them. I think you can't. You can't take back the I bombs, think people, right? You, you, people often think about these, these issues and very 
short term, I guess. So it's like, okay, well, how, how do you stop the person who's about to, to commit this act? Whereas it's going to be something so much broader and more structural than that to stop this happening long term, as not it? It's, it's got to be, you've got to be dismantling entire kind of ways of, treating people and dealing with the world in general i think it, it's it's not we're often very we're very focused on the short term and obviously you need to be focused on the short term but you also have got to have that kind of long view to to try and fix these problems on a on a longer scale i think yeah, i mean in 2001 i mean our my country i say our country my country got very upset over our towers coming down and 2000 people dying or whatever it was and we instantly invaded Afghanistan and we just start killing people. I mean, that's, I guess that's fine and dandy, but man, <laughs> we killed families and babies and moms and dads and cousins and uncles and aunts and destroyed water pipes and infrastructure and electricity and schools and hospitals. I mean, did we mean to do all this stuff? I don't know what we were doing. I'm not a, I was in the army in 95. I probably would have delivered bombs and <laughs> all types of horrible stuff. I mean, just, I love fiction because of all this stuff. You know what I mean? You think about the roads and how things work and who the antagonists are and who the good guys are. And it just gets so muddled. This thing yeah. starts like joining together and you're like, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? How do things actually work? I mean, somebody has a plan and then somebody wants to make that plan useless. The, uh, the Death Star in Star Wars. I mean, at the end of the day, is the Empire the bad guys or the Rebels the bad guys? Depends who the left and the right is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Who, um, who voted for who? <laughs> <laughs> well, who the uh, Donald Trump supporters are and who the Hillary Clinton supporters are, who the yeah. Theresa May supporters are and who the other ones are, or whatever you have you. I think that's probably one of the the good things about fiction is that it can it can make you think about these things more than I mean a lot of people in the real world have quite set polarized political views but then if you read something that actually presents to you the fact that you've got two sides who both have reason to believe that they are the good guys then you start actually thinking about things a little bit more and maybe you can translate that back into the real world and and start seeing things in a slightly more nuanced way i guess well you don't so, want that though in I fiction think... do you you want fiction black and can... white right i mean you want somebody to cheer for her and you want somebody to cheer against you want somebody to lose you want to hate somebody and you want to love somebody regardless of whether you peel back the layers on the one that you love and find that underneath is this rotten core of, <laughs> you know, they're a kid. Oh man. <laughs> have, have you ever read I don't seen... know. I mean... <laughs> Go ahead. There are, I don't know. There, there are a lot of different books that, sorry. No, I was, I was just telling you to go. I was just, have you ever read the book Sapien? It's a book about human history uh, and anthrop uh, anthropological. Sorry. Oh. Uh, what's that? Sorry, you went a little bit crackly there. It's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the book is Sapien. It's an anthropological history. I think you're of, back yeah. now. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Anna? Yep. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can. Can you okay. hear me? I can. You're perfect. You never went away. Um, have you ever read um, Sapien? I uh, haven't, no, no. Uh, it's an anthropological history of humans from 2.5 million years ago until present, I think. And uh, the author is discussing uh, how wheat domesticated humans like 9,000 years ago through needing to be taken care of, basically by needing to be watered and cared for and, you know, breaking our backs with uh, basically the day-to-day -day maintenance of it, domesticating us basically and how kingships and lordships are basically set up and enslaving humans, taxing us so that, you know, we take care of the land and then pay up and all that good stuff. If you think about what kings are, 
the horribleness of what that actually is, the servitude of humans. If you write a fantasy story with a king or a queen, you're actually writing about, you know, horrible people. <laughs> so I'm just yes. throwing that out there. I mean, if you're writing about doing a quest <laughs> for a king, I mean, this dude that's uh, enslaved the kingdom to do bidding for him. And they, I don't know. Just yeah, I think that's it's really interesting. It sounds like an interesting book. Um, and writing I, something right I now that of, I thought about adding it in there, but the thing's are already too long, so I had to nip it in the bud. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think so. In in my in my books, I have tried. To, obviously, there is there's like an overlord, and so this is the you know the family of shapeshifters and they they rule by virtue of having this power etc but i have tried to present that as not necessarily being totally a good thing and so i think if you if you have these things in but you you, you question them a little bit then you can kind of still work with these sort of tropes but just with a little bit of analysis i guess almost so that you're, you're looking at them in a slightly different way is that the the protagonist or the antagonist so the protagonist is well she's from from that the family of who yeah the overlords um but she um they've they've sort of reached the end of their natural life almost in the they they've come to a point where they they can't really survive without letting new ideas in and sort of yeah new relationships not be so closed off to everything and i think that's probably good principle yeah it's very interesting and that's dark haven that's how you start the series oh hello yes yeah that is how it starts yeah Am I breaking up? Anna? Hello? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, there we go. Hello? I'm working on... Uh, Hello? <laughs> Oh, across the pond, like <laughs> it's the virtue of modern technology, how horrible, and yet at the same time, what a blessing. <laughs> I'm using my wife's computer and mine at the same, I had a, a laptop sitting right next to me and I decided to crap out. It's like, for some reason, can't use my desktop for this purpose. Oh man. Um. So what's going on? You're writing a new novel series. You're putting the the series that you have published on hold for the time being dark haven is yeah. that the name of the series or just the name of the first novel what is the series called does it's it have a... both dark haven okay so the series yeah it's the name of the series and the book and you're really not giving any information out about what you're currently working on right now just in case other than you're working on something new? Um, probably not really much more than, than we talked <laughs> about earlier, I think. Um, what else can you tell us about your, your current state of writing other than you're incredibly hardworking? I mean, I, I really am kind of odd by the kind of effort that you put in, in terms of your your job and the day. I mean, God, I can even imagine editing other people's work and then coming home and then writing and dealing with a three-year-old and a five-year-old. My children like slam me in the brain. I'm gonna go pick them up in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter is, she is like the sweetest little thing on the face of the planet when she's in a good mood but my son is like a little ball of energy 
<laughs> my my mom cursed me. She's like, I hope you have a son just like you. And I was like, no, oh, mom. And then I have a son just like me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, so yours are twins, then, right? I do. Yeah, boy and girl, yeah. two and a half years old. And you're telling me that it doesn't get any easier. So thank you for that. <laughs> it does in a way, <laughs> but then it doesn't as well. So it's, I think it gets easier in that, that you can have a rational conversation with them more as they get older. So that's good. But then they're also able to argue back, <laughs> which is not necessarily so good. So yeah, it's, um, it's certainly, every day is brings some sort of new challenge so yeah all good fun really i'm guessing logic doesn't work <laughs> on them i i'm not sure when they develop logic but it's not not yet <laughs> tautologies no daughter that's not true that's actually a fallacy <laughs> <laughs> so um i really i really really appreciate you agreeing to be to be on my show um and talking with me it was really a lot of fun uh i i ask well, a few thank questions. you for inviting me it's, yeah, it's been ask, good to talk <laughs> yeah absolutely and i ask a few questions just to, to sign us out to you know write us out of the show i kind of ramble on and kind of go all over the place especially when I get excited about certain topics. And if I made you uncomfortable, I definitely apologize. Um, no, not at all. But we're at the conclusion. Oh, good. Good. You're very, you're very soft-spoken and, and very, are you, do you do a lot of podcasting? I have never done podcasting at all. This is not quite a new all. thing for me. So, okay. Well, <laughs> this um, is, uh, yeah, it's, You've introduced me to a new world here. So, <laughs> would you be interested in doing it again? Yeah, it, it's it seems like fun, and I like the fact that that people can't see me. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I, I get embarrassed when I'm in front of a camera. So, the voice I, uh, thing is good. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I've done uh, one other podcast on camera with my friend Emma Hardcastle. She's up in Yorkshire, like north of you, I guess. Okay. And she made yeah. me do it on camera and I sat through the entire time staring at myself because you know how like they, they say <laughs> if you put the camera above yourself it, it makes you look you know better <laughs> yeah. so I put the camera at what I thought was an angle but it really was like kind of below me so I kept scrunching down in my chair to make myself look you know like it was below <laughs> me <laughs> so I'm like I'm trying my hardest to, to to scrunch down so it was above me and the entire I didn't even know how I actually looked on the camera because I'm staring at my phone which does not take good pictures by the way and when I actually looked at the YouTube <laughs> video all I saw was myself looking more and more scrunched in my chair it was the worst thing ever so I would never do that to anybody <laughs> never and the entire time that I'm talking, good. Yeah. oh my God, it was so <laughs> horrible. Oh, she says, no, you look fine. And I do another podcast that's called Mirage, speculating on speculative fiction. And if you have an author that you love, we can definitely, it, like we, we geek out about authors. We can definitely do that if you'd like. But um, we do one together occasionally and we were brainstorming titles. And she goes, oh, we can call it the the Brit and the Toad. And I was like, why the Toad? Because you look like a Toad in my video. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? No, it's complimentary. <laughs> I was like, you jerk. You're such a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're not doing a podcast together yeah, anymore. Yeah, so <laughs> let's avoid the, avoid the video, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doing video, very, very bad. <laughs> So Anna, <laughs> secretive F-E, I'm just going to guess, it's Frank Edgar, right? I Franklin like it, Edgar. that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thoroughly enjoyed talking with you, it was fantastic. I do ask a couple questions, just uh, or three questions actually to get us out. Um, the first one is just about motivating other artists. Um, what do you tell somebody who comes to you and says, hey, I'd like to write too, what, what would you recommend somebody struggling to write or to create art? I think 
I would recommend finding someone else who you trust to look at your stuff and maybe you look at theirs as well so you you know like a beta reader type of thing someone because it can be a really solitary thing to do writing and particularly if the people in your family aren't really that involved in it or or whatever it can, it can feel quite you're quite alone and so having a few friends who are also authors who you can kind of talk about these things with and share work with I think that's a really good thing to have a group of people to talk with and share absolutely that's one thing I struggle with is finding people to share my work with I'm trying really hard to find a, a critique group just to send my stuff yeah. and then finding somebody to not to read other stuff because time is so limited especially at you know you have kids and a job and a husband and do you have a dog? Man, a good dog. <laughs> that would be one step too far, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have a dog. She, man, she demands to be walked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every okay. little bit of time. I mean, it's like tick, 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 tick. And the next thing you know, you're exhausted and you can't do anything more. And where are you going to find Yeah, time so in? finding somebody who who's willing to give up that, that time for you, but also you for them so I think finding someone whose work you like and they like your work that's always really good and then you you've got someone there who you can you'll both make the time for each other I guess so and willing to offer you an honest opinion and not gonna blow yeah smoke. definitely yeah, definitely because definitely. So it doesn't help to say oh I liked it or oh, really what'd you like about it well I just liked it that's not helpful <laughs> that's not helpful yeah. you want somebody to tell you well this 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 I thought needed work and this is what I thought would make it help that stuff is very beneficial, definitely. It is, definitely. Um, second question would be, what are you reading? What's on your table in your nightstand or what's on the, what's on your phone open right now that you can't I am read reading, I am reading Red Sister by Mark Lawrence and I've Mark only just started it. Lawrence. He does Mark a Lawrence, blog off. Yeah. A science fiction blog off that's, that's really right. popular. That's right. He does. Do yes. you, are you involved and in I've that? I've been involved in judging it actually because. Um, really. I, yeah, a little bit because I'm part of the the fantasy faction team. So, yeah, as a group, there's a whole group of us who who do the fantasy faction. I have talked to uh, and so, Dirk yeah. Ashton, and I have talked to Jonathan French. Yes. If you know either one of their names. Okay, yeah, I do, because Dirk Ashton was um, our place. choice last year. Yeah, so we, we put him forward from our group to the finals last year. Oh, really? Yeah. I talked, he was the, my number so one podcast <laughs> ever. And then uh, uh, Jonathan French was my number 50 podcast ever. They're great guys. <laughs> I, I, I'm very, and that, that blog off is very, um, it keeps popping up. Maybe one year I'll actually participate if I ever write a fantasy novel. <laughs> yeah definitely i think it seems to be really valuable for quite a lot of people and um yeah find just just discovering new authors as well just you get you come across so many different people who you might not have come across before so i think i yeah. should actually read a mark lawrence novel there too <laughs> <laughs> you think that's important to know his work before participating in the blog off uh it, i don't think it will affect it either way so but i by all means read his stuff anyway because it's good <laughs> um is it only for fantasy or can science fiction um work get placed it's, in a... it's a fantasy it's specifically oh, for my. fantasy this one so maybe yeah. in a few years i do have a <laughs> i do have a, a fantasy novel kind of building up but i'm writing science fiction at the moment um, but that's interesting. Okay, well, You're yeah. number three. Wow. Maybe Mark Lawrence will be on this podcast one day. You should ask him for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my last question is, where can we find you? Where is, uh, you can find you? me. I'm on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter, um, which is just at AFE Smith. Um, I have a Facebook page. I have a website, as you know, which is just afesmith.com. Um, that's pretty much, those are my main three. I, I, I can't keep track of all the social media, so I have quite a limited <laughs> amount of it. So those three places are pretty much it for me. 
I, I agree that it's really it's better to keep it limited. I have the website, I have the Twitter, and I and I don't Facebook at all. I have very limited ability to do anything there. <laughs> Um, like I said, this has been very enjoyable. I, I really had a good time talking with you. I hope that we can do it again. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you talking with me. Well, thank you for having me. And I really enjoyed talking to you too. You have a great day or a great night, actually. You too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.